Hello, welcome to Life Questions. I'm your host, Bill Harris. If you're looking for answers to some of life's most pressing problems, you've come to the right place. Life Questions specializes in biblical solutions to pressing issues about life. We're always grateful to you, our viewers, for the questions and inquiries that you send us. And so we've amassed, amassed a panel of local ministers to address your, your questions following their in-depth research into your questions. And I'd like you to meet them now. We begin with Pastor Greg Fox of Rawson New Hope United Methodist and the Bluffton Trinity United Methodist Churches, followed by Pastor Mark Byrd, who is state chairman of Revive Ohio, then Pastor Bill Prater of Auglaize Free United Baptist Church of Maysville, and rounding up our panel today is Pastor John Hayward, who is associate pastor of Grace Community Church in Lima, Ohio. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you with us today. And I want to begin with a question that we got in from our viewers that I think is really great to start this uh, conversation off with such a panel of, uh, um, of uh, men, distinguished men like yourselves. A study in Christianity Today suggests that at the start of this year, 38% of pastors were considered leaving their profession due to burnout, due to burnout. Uh, what can be done to better support pastors and encourage them to keep going on. What, what's going on with the pastor these days, gentlemen? Well, I think a lot of your smaller churches aren't able to have a, pay a full-time pastor. So they end up taking one on part-time and then he has to share responsibilities with another church, which in turn, they're used to having a full-time pastor. So they're requiring as much as a full-time pastor at both places. And they do tend to get burned out. Wow, that's interesting. Anything else that you gentlemen would like to add to that? I think of what uh, John says in uh, 3 John 1. He says, I have no greater joy than this than to hear my children walking in the truth. And so I think for a, for a pastor to see people in his church loving the Lord, walking in the truth, that, that really encourages us more than really almost anything else. Mm -hmm. And so um, as you want to encourage your pastor, I think just apply the word that is being taught and walk joyfully with him and with the Lord. And I, I think that brings a lot of uh, encouragement to the pastor and to the whole church family. Mm -hmm. So are you saying then uh, somewhat the reverse that maybe there's a lot of folks that are not doing that and that's leading to the burnout? It, it could be, yeah, because if, if uh, people aren't walking in the truth, then they get hung up on secondary issues, they get frustrated, they take it out on whoever will listen, which right. often is the pastor. Um, so I, I think that, that a lack of walking in the truth can cause all sorts of negative problems for the church and ultimately for the pastor. Yeah. Amen. Right, pastor, what do you think? Do you sense this, uh, this pressure on pastors? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I don't have a large congregation. So, but I'm grateful uh, that, but I am very, well, you're right. There is problems. It's, sometimes it's with the pastor himself. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he gets to the point that he gets discouraged because the people won't show up. Uh, they just, and they don't want to hear the word. Mm -hmm. They don't believe the word. They don't practice what they should be practicing. They're not living a, I'm old fashioned, mm -hmm. the Christian life, the way according to the word of God. And that's where we're problem is today. And the pastors say, well, if they're not going to listen, I'm just going to go on. But I'm not that way. I'm still going to be pastor no matter what because of who God is. Amen. Because he called me. They never call me. And if, <clears throat> excuse me, if they don't like what I got to say, <laughs> and it comes from the Lord. It's not who Bill Prater is. It's who Christ is in me. That's what I look at. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. well, Mark and I was talking earlier. And Mark, you had a good point about the congregation and pastors. Yeah, yeah so, uh, you know, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, that uh, in verse 11, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12, I think, unreals what we're talking about here today for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. I think, and it goes right along with what Pastor John said, honestly. So when you see the saints get it, and start to contribute. 
to mm -hmm. the work of the ministry. Mm -hmm. I think that brings not only relief, but it brings joy, mm -hmm. like John mm -hmm. writes. It mm -hmm. brings joy mm -hmm. to the pastor. And what does joy do? It overrides discouragement, yeah. overrides yeah. bitterness, frustration, all of those things. Yeah. The joy of the Lord is her strength, you know, yeah. Yeah. Nehemiah writes. And so I, what I think happens is as the church begins to rise up to help do the work of the ministry, because, you know, I've heard saints over the years say, well, you know, that's the pastor's job. That's what we pay them for. <laughs> We're in a sense, right? But in the in the truth, in the in the New Testament church, Paul's writing like we're given as gifts to the church to equip you to help do the work of the ministry. Yeah. And I think that will help. If, the question is, how can we help our pastors who are feeling discouraged and burnout and all these things? And I think mm -hmm. that will help. Are uh, there yeah. certain things, certain dynamics that are going on in society or in today's world that that, that contribute to these things? Oh, most definitely, I do believe. I mean, for some reason, and, and I'm not a, a fan of it at all, but for some reason, the church and God have become second. You know, on Sunday mornings, if we have a soccer game, that's more important than coming to church with God or football practice or basketball or whatever the case is. And if we have a free Sunday, then, hey, we'll go to church. Instead of, you know, when we were all brought up, we was brought up in the time that you went to church and then you did mm -hmm. something else. So. I think it's just part of society and, and, and where we're putting our emphasis right now. Mm -hmm. The sad part of it is, it's not about the money. If you are truly called into the ministry, I believe that you will not be, have your mentality on how much I get or what I get. Mm -hmm. It's when you see the people respond, like we're saying there, to what you are ministering, the Word of God, and putting God first. And like Greg said, man, it, basketball, football, sports comes before God anymore. And that's a sad situation. When I was a kid growing up, they never had such things on Sunday mornings. We didn't have basketball or baseball. It was a holy day. It was a day that was given unto the Lord. And, uh, so society has changed. Yep. Society, oh, society, uh, yeah, I guess. Wow. I think what it boils down to, Bill, is is the culture dictating to the church or is the church dictating to the culture? And I've had these discussions with many pastors in different cities and I understand, and they understand that there's a lot of pressure from the culture because the parents are saying, well, hey, listen, I'm sorry. That's when the coach is scheduled. That's yeah. when, you know, that and so there's a lot of pressure and the, and the, and the pastors are saying, well, you know, we want to be loving. We want to be grace filled, all these things. But that's, I think what the bottom line is, is the culture dictating to the church mm -hmm. or is the church dictating to the culture? Good. Mm -hmm. Which I guess is all the more need for revival to get some yeah. of these uh, influential entities to come to Christ. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, would it behoove the church to to reach out more to the community? Do you think to try to help with these influencing factors? I definitely do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Personally, I believe that that's what the church's role is. Right? Yeah. We're called to let our light shine before men, that they will see your good works right. and glorify your Father. Father. Right. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really, you know, it may sound like a really old fashioned, archaic thing, but it's really relevant today as it ever was. Right. And Jesus said, these are the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God never changes. Right. He's still the same yesterday, today and forever. He is God. And we need to reverence him and honor him with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength. And people have grown weak and it's not some pastors might say, like you said, we're, I might be an old fashioned person, but that's the way I was brought up, the way I was taught, that we put God first, family second, and everything else would come into play. As long as we put God first, everything else will happen just the way it's supposed to. But we don't want to do that like Bill's culture. I'm not into the culture. I'm into who he is, who Christ is, what he did for me. Right. Mm -hmm. And when people realize what he's truly did for them upon the cross, gave his life's blood. Mm -hmm. I get stirred up when I talk about the blood. <laughs> that, that turns me off, on a lot when people talk about the blood. I love huh. that. Pastor Hayward, could you add to this discussion? I, I think you're right. If, if, if we um, ourselves are, feel loved by God, mm -hmm. 
we are going to overflow with love yeah, first toward absolutely. God and then toward others. You know, John says we love because he first loved us. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And so does the church feel unloved by God? Is that what keeps us from loving each other well, loving the world well? So it, it seems like one of our jobs as pastors mm -hmm. is to keep pointing people to the work of Christ on the cross, oh, amen. ourselves being excited by that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm a beloved child That's of the right. king of the universe because of the blood of Christ. Right. You no, know, if that gets me excited, and I'm able to point to God's word, that's tr truth that changes the people in the church who then you know, go out into the world with a different kind of attitude. Another thing I think about is the Bible says about, except the Lord build the house, mm -hmm. we labor in vain. Mm -hmm. So we've kicked God out. We've kicked him out because we wanna be, like Oelva said, I did it my way. <laughs> it's not about who we are. It's all about him. Yeah. It's all about Christ. Yeah. And instead of kicking him out, maybe maybe a, a better way or another way to maybe say it <laughs> is is we we neglected God. That's like we, we we for, we we get together and we think about ourselves yes. instead of thinking about the Lord. Right. And we put him on a shelf. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting what Pastor John said too. Uh, I'm reminded of Paul writing to the second. Uh, Second Corinthian letter in chapter five, he says, the love of Christ compels Amen. us. Amen. Right. That's what compels us right. to keep love. on. Yep. Love. Yep. He we said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Right. Amen. And my commandments, commandments are not grievous. Yep. Amen. It's as the Christian song says on the radio, a little less of me um, and a little more he. Yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. what a song. Yeah. 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 That's one of my favorites. <laughs> You know, there's a there's a companion situation here that's equally as bad, I think, that and uh, that is the rise of fear and anxiety, mm -hmm. fear of the present and anxiety of tomorrow. How do you pastors deal with that? It's in society. It's in people. You can see it in the behavior. Um, it's just there. Fear and anxiety. How do you minister to those? Well, first of all, it's a real thing. Okay, there's some of my brothers and sisters. Uh, that kind of teach that, you know, it's not really real, but it really is real, right? It really is a real thing. Fear and anxiety are a real thing, they, but they don't come from God. Right. And so I think, again, you bring it down to brass tacks, and it is fear comes from the enemy, right? Anxiety mm -hmm. comes from, mm -hmm. the, from the enemy, but love comes from God. Mm -hmm. And what First John writes is that perfect love, and I'm going to say this in parentheses, this is Mark, understanding perfect love casts out fear. Mm -hmm. So we will have fear come at us, right? Mm -hmm. Founded or unfounded, regardless of that, fear will try to come at us. And so when we understand his perfect love, that helps us cast out that fear, right? Mm -hmm. By fixing our minds and hearts on Christ. Uh, you know, Paul writes that if you think upon these things, Right. Think mm -hmm. upon these things that are good, that are pure, that mm -hmm. are trustworthy, that are holy. Think upon these things. Why? Because the enemy will try to get us to think upon fearful things yep. and, and think, anxiety things. And, and that's really the key. I think it starts with what we think, what we put in our minds. And I appreciate the, the form this question came in because the person asked, uh, I want to create a notebook of powerful ver verses to pull out in times of need. So, yeah, yeah. so, so one of our listeners said, I, I want truth from God's word to help yeah. me to put in my mind. And so one I thought of is uh, Psalm 56, mm. th th verses three and four says, when I am afraid, which kind of gets to your point that fear is a real thing. Sure. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose words I praise. In God, I've put my trust. I shall not be afraid. For what can mere man do to me? Right. So I look outside, things look scary. Man could do something to me, but if I change my thinking, it's like yes. I put my hope in God, relative to God, what can man do to me? Nothing. Right. Uh, and the, uh, the author of Hebrews quotes that same verse in Psalm, uh, in uh, Hebrews 13. Mm -hmm. uh, another verse about fear that's really helped me a lot is Matthew chapter 6, the end of the chapter there. Do not worry, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? The Gentiles seek these things. Seek first. God's kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. I mean, I've been afraid about finances lots of times in my yes. life, but that verse has brought me peace and calm mm -hmm. in the midst of uncertainty. Yeah. Right, excellent. Well, listen, we need to take a break at this point, And when we come back, I'd like to continue on this because we need to dig deep down. There are people out there who are grappling with fear and anxiety and we, we need to help them. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this.
don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pasture suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back. Gentlemen, we know that uh, the, the source of fear is the devil. Amen. It's the devil. But what tools is he using to invoke fear in society, and to, to invoke fear in people? What tools is he using? What would you say? I think there's many tools that the devil has. Uh, you know, Paul writes to the Ephesians that he's the prince of the power of the air. And so I think at his disposal are the airwaves. So mm -hmm. I think he uses lots mm -hmm. of media, mm -hmm. social media, internet, radio, mm -hmm. TV, those sorts of things. Those mm -hmm. are some of the tools that he uses. But as Pastor John shared, he tries to invoke those things in our mind. So the mind is the battlefield, if you will. Paul writes to the Philippian church in Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And mm -hmm. I think what's key is when you have those thoughts, because we all will, sure. every single one of us will have temptations to be anxious or fearful, or Matthew wouldn't have wrote about it, and all these authors would not have wrote about it. But when we do, what do we do with that, mm -hmm. right? Don't be anxious, but by everything that we have, in all that anxiousness, bring it to God. Mm -hmm. And uh, Greg made a point on break about that relationship with God, and I think it's worth repeating. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, how do we form relationships and where do we find love? When we find our spouse, we form a relationship with them, and then in, in the end, you know, love is cultivated from that relationship. The same thing holds true with God. You have to have a relationship with God to feel His love and to share that relationship to build your you know, to build that, that love and trust in one another. You know, it, it tells us in Psalm 25, the very first verse, very first verse, in you, Lord, my trust I put in you. And that's, mm -hmm. that's where it's at. It's mm -hmm. all about trust and love. Yep. Pastor, you want to make comments? I think that I'm going to be upfront and honest. A lot of people have been taught wrong. They're, the doctrine of a lot of churches are, is wrong. They're saying that you don't have, like you're saying, Pat, brother, they don't, you can't go out, you don't have anger, you don't have fear, you don't have depression. All these things, if you do, you're not living right with God. Right. And so what does it do? It brings guilt to you. Yes. It brings all these things upon you. And I was talking to a friend of mine last night. We had a meeting. He said, and I'm, a, well, can I, can I say this? <laughs> the Word of Faith movement. Mm -hmm. I remember the time when it first started. It sounded so good. It sounded so good. And he said to, that this couple, they got involved with it. They just became young Christians. And they got so caught up in it. They went to Walpock, Canetta. They saw this house that they wanted. They began to covet it what it amounts to and there's somebody lives in that house it doesn't belong to you and God isn't going to give you something that's not yours he's not going to give you something that's not right and it's not God's will for you to take that house because somebody already owns it but they went around confessing that we're going to ha that's our house that's our house and then people get when they don't get it they get anxious they get upset and they start blaming God. So we need to get around people that are preaching the truth instead of going around. That's not word of faith. That's word of uh, convic convicciousness, isn't it? <laughs> that's right. Isn't that word of faith? Bring you condemnation. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we, need to get a, we need to stay away from the wrong doctrine. We need to follow Christ and let Him be the ruler of our lives. Trust, trust in Him. Amen. Amen. That is a correct word of faith when you do it that way, though. That's right. <laughs> that is a correct word of faith Amen. because yeah. you got to have right. faith is to be spoken. Right. right. You, 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 but you, you just don't. But you don't, don't covet something yeah, that already belongs to somebody don't, else. Don't 
can't say, I want that. It's mm -hmm. mine. Yeah. And God says, no, it's not yours. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody else. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, a couple things. Yeah. Uh, the question was, and Pastor John mentioned this, uh, this writer uh, writes in and says, I want to create a notebook of powerful verses to pull out, mm -hmm. right? We've mentioned a couple of them, but I want to mention just a couple of more uh, okay. to answer the question. Second Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit, a spirit of fear, fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So that's worth writing down, I think. And then uh, the scripture that I referred to earlier, but didn't quote the reference, 1 John 4, 18, that perfectly love casts out fear. So mm -hmm. if you want to write down some verses to kind of meditate on or have on standby, I think it's uh, helpful for all of us. One more I thought of was Isaiah 43. The Lord says, um, Oh Israel, do not fear for I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. Mm -hmm. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. The rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, they will not scorch you, nor will the flame burn you. So God promising to right. care for his people in the midst of some really hard circumstances. And as we've been saying, people are afraid for some good reasons. I mean, right. life is hard. And so to know that God is promised in the midst of that hardness to mm -hmm. take care of us gives us comfort in the midst of some difficult situations. So that's Isaiah 43. Yeah, the first part of that you were reading spoke to a very personal relationship yes. with the Lord. Yes. Right. Did you notice right. that exactly. what, you, what you were yeah. talking about earlier? Exactly. Yeah. That, that's key too. Yeah. Well, let's turn the subject to something else that I think can help people. Uh, here's another um, letter that we got in from viewers. According to a Pew Research, about half of Generation Z and Millennials say that same-sex marriage is good for society. And in parenthesis, the person writes that the, the Generation Z is at 48% on this, Millennials 47%, Generation X 33%, the Boomers, or the Baby Boomers, 27%, uh, the Silent Generation, I guess that's prior to the um, Boomers, is 18%. So how should Christians respond to this? Hmm. What do you think? Uh, well, I believe um, it's pretty well laid out for us in the Bible. Um, in Leviticus, it tells us the do's and the don'ts. And there's a lot of things that are up for interpretation in the Bible. This is not one of them. God does not find it holy. God does not believe in it. He does not condone it. And I know that's not a very popular stand. But I believe that's Jesus' stand on it, and I believe that's, if I'm, if I'm following our, our, our guide for life and our rule book here, you have to believe that. And, but and they Jesus wanted to teach out. this in the schools now, because they're saying that it has to do with the rights of individuals who make those choices, mm -hmm. and that it should be taught even to our children. Yeah. That's what they're saying. So, uh, you know, I think it goes all the way back, honestly, to Genesis chapter 2, right, to go all the way back when we're starting to talk about the foundation of the world, right? Mm -hmm. and, and right after that God created man, right? He said it's good for man to not be alone. Right. So, of course, uh, he quotes, uh, and I'm quoting out of Genesis 2, 23, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. And verse 24 is what I want to focus on. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Mm -hmm. So that was the original creation, right? And uh, the blueprint was laid, the foundation mm -hmm. was laid. And you know, it's interesting, like you, you talk about uh, a car. So if a car gets made, and it says, you know what, I want to be an elephant. It doesn't matter how much the car wants to be an elephant. It was made as a car. Yeah. How did we get up off of this foundation? How did we get away from it? I think it's the same thing we've been talking about. The enemy, right? The enemy of God, who is the devil. And he's all of our enemy as we're in a relationship with God as well. And he wants to distract us and lead us away from God's original design. And his plan, according to John 10:10, 10, 10, is to kill, kill, steal, and destroy. That's his motive. That's his plan. He's going to continue with that. And he wants to distract us, I believe, from what Greg's talking about, that relationship with God. And here's what God says. Here's what this is like. Here's how I designed it, mm -hmm. the Bible says. And so the enemy is trying to distract us and say, the same thing that the enemy said to Eve in the garden, exactly. did God really mm -hmm. say? 
and, and in that questioning, he's not only questioning God's word, he's questioning God's goodness. Yes. Right. Like God isn't good, God is withholding something good from you. Mm -hmm. I think the same thing is happening in the sexual arena that w we say sex is a great gift from God. It's one man and one woman in a lifelong, lifelong covenant of marriage and that's good. Right. And we need, to, especially we need to convince our young people in church that that's good. God did not give that rule because he's mean, because he's unkind, because he's withholding something, but because it's good for us. And I, I think of Deuteronomy chapter 10, where uh, Moses says, uh, walk in his ways, love him, serve him with all your heart and soul, keep the Lord's commandments and statutes which I'm commanding you today for your own good. Yes. So God's command of marriage being the place for sex is a good command. And we need to convince our young kids of that so that it's not, oh, God's, grumpy and he's withholding something good from me. No, he's not. He's giving you something good exactly. by putting this structure in place. See, the basis of all this falls back on the family. Mm -hmm. um, we've become an entitlement society. We've become a feel-good society. And if you think way back, even by my grandparents and beyond, we all wanted a little bit better for each of our kids. So we actually made life easier on them so that it could have better. You know, and it tells us right in chapter 5 in Leviticus, it says in the very first the very first verse, it says, if anyone sins because they do not speak up, when they hear a public charge to testify regarding something they have seen or learned about, they will be held responsible. And basically what it amounts to is we as fellow Christians are not standing up and saying, hey, okay, wait a minute. Yes, it might feel good. Yes, you might feel that's the, the thing to do. But God tells us right here in the Bible that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And how can you go against the Almighty? He lays it down for us. And once we start saying, well, I don't want to ruffle their feathers. I don't want to upset them. That's when we as Christians start to sin mm -hmm. because we're not standing up for yeah. God's word. I, I see how they, they've changed laws. They're trying to get it promoted in schools and in other parts of our culture. But I've always said that there's no right way to do wrong. Right. You know, it, this is what I see that, that's happening here. And... Um, People that are blinded by this are falling right into it. And uh, is it that we are, as Christians, are reluctant to speak out on this for fear of being called bigots and uh, homophobic and, and that kind of thing? Is, is that? Ooh. I think partially because they are standing up and calling us that, right, in the arena. And then we as, oh, in, in an attempt to go, well, I better be peaceable among all men, I better not say anything. And so what's happening because of that, because we are holding our peace, because we are not speaking up, mm -hmm. then I think they're speaking up. So I want to share this scripture out of Proverbs 11:11. Mm -hmm. 11, 11, okay, and it says, by the blessing of the upright, the righteous, a city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. And, okay, we're, we're out of time now, but what was that verse again? One more <laughs> Pro, uh, Proverbs 11, 11. Proverbs 11, 11. Okay, well, we're all out of time. Thank you very much. And uh, let me just say to our uh, audience that uh, these same fine gentlemen will be back with us again next week on this program so that we can continue our discussions. We'd like you to be with us then, okay? Until then, I'm Bill Harris for these gentlemen. God bless you. We hope to see you next week. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.